come right back in <laughs> and now we're live to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny i really thought there was an audio on that scene but here we are <laughs> <laughs> uh it looks like you've got some fans in chat your boy crub and levy duncan yes i'm so yes. excited i am so incredibly thrilled because i remember like I think it was like a year ago when I first saw you streaming and I saw you working on like a, um, a clone of, oh gosh, I can't remember the name, but it had this little character that's traveling through a 2D world with Dragon Ruby. And I remember yeah, Legend how of Zelda. incredibly impressed I was. Legend of Zelda. Oh, yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that I want to ask about, especially because I recently listened to one of your podcasts where you talked a lot about like the developer experience with Dragon Ruby. But first of all, I just mm -hmm. want to start with like, I'm going to do this correctly first time. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? <laughs> uh, I'm going to take the uh, Aaron Patterson approach and say, hi, I'm Amir Rajan. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Flawless. No, it's done. I'll, I'll do the bragging. Don't worry. So Amir uh, Rajan is I'm a the code creator hobo. of... <laughs> that's that's the best definition for me. compliments. I'm just a, I'm just a code hobo. Like I've tried to explain what I do, and that's probably the best thing. I'm a vagrant. I'm a vagabond of some type. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one claim to fame I have is that I'm the most successful game Ruby game developer in the entire world because I'm wow. probably the only one. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! We just got a raid from New Relic. Thank you so much, uh, New Relic. And you just missed Amir's introduction, but. <laughs> So can we just reverse all that, Ramirez, and just say it all over again? I am a code hobo. <laughs> Perfect. I build, I build video games in Ruby, and uh, uh, I, I'm the best game develop, Ruby game developer in the world because I'm the only one of them. <laughs> I think I remember you running several game jams utilizing, like, Dragon Ruby. So mm -hmm. I don't think you're the only one. Yeah, um... Uh, that's that's true. That's true. Uh, luckily, luckily, over the past two years, um, I've been able to. Uh, that's when the game engine released. Right. Uh, well, Dragon Ruby is the runtime, and the Dragon Ruby game toolkit is the actual engine itself. Uh, the mm -hmm. the game engine on top of the runtime. And uh, over the past two years, uh, we've kind of grown the community. I think we're over over uh, pretty close to two thousand members in the Discord right now. So mm -hmm. um, yes, lots of people are finally seeing the joy of of using ruby and it's the it's the most wonderful thing because um all the ruby devs are just we've been in it for so long and uh the realm of game dev is just it's new so you have people that have never that have never touched ruby seeing the magic of the language again and it's just one of those things where we take it for granted when we first started learning ruby and we're like oh this is so incredible and then just to see that like kind of like light in someone else's eyes it's just it feels so good yeah hold up so i didn't even know this existed i am kind of amazed right now i was like oh dragon ruby cool it must be like some gem or something <laughs> but you're this is really cool i'm really excited to be kind of digging deep into this with you yeah yeah and uh just like as a testament to you know the the platform itself i mean i have a game on the nintendo switch that is built with dragon ruby wow so Yep. So if you go to if you go to like yeah, just go to Nintendo and uh, uh, type in a dark room Nintendo Switch, and this game is built using using this engine. And um, uh, uh, I have uh, six other properties uh, primarily on mobile right now that I'm, I'll be porting over to Nintendo Switch. But um, uh, of those properties, I mean, uh, a dark room uh, to date probably has, I think, all my games across the board have uh, lifetime four million downloads so far. Wow. across the seven year period so um this is the real deal like um yeah yeah we, i hit the I'm number one spot in the app store back in 2014 um that was that was really interesting impressive. that was my claim to fame yeah. that is so cool yeah it's I'm wild really when the new yorker scared. contacts you <laughs> it's like, hi <laughs> you'd like to do an interview and like you do so tell me about yourself i'm the code hobo <laughs> 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 i'm like split right now because I really want to do one of two things. I either want to force you to accept more compliments because that's the sort of person that I am, or I really want to know why you picked Ruby and why you decided to build Dragon Ruby with it. Like, what yeah, was yeah, the language? So I can, uh, so I did 
the funny thing is my strongest language is C-sharp. I've been doing uh, C-sharp the longest and I started um, in the .NET ecosystem and I would, uh, around 2000, yeah, the year 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, till 2013 is when I did um, C-sharp development. There's Lump, hi Lump. Lump. <laughs> Lump, you can see Lump's butt. <laughs> Uh, I got to show you Lump. You know, this this needs to be entertaining. Oh, That's lump. Lumpy. <laughs> That's Lumpers. And then uh, the, the puppy next to him is Taco Truck. <laughs> um, Lump I don't know like, how old he is. Cone. I'm going to hang out with Taco Truck. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea how old Taco Truck is. Um, he's got two teeth. That's it. Oh, wow. And, um, he, you can't do this to me. Are these I'm your so pets or your roommates? What? <laughs> they're they're rescues. They're my they're my little puppies and rescues. So yeah. So yeah, you have Lump with the cone and Taco Truck with two tru uh, two teeth, um, and uh, you know the name fits fits his physique obviously, but um, there we have that. Uh, but yeah, so 2013 is uh, I was doing I was still doing .NET development starting in uh, around 2010, and I started doing build automation. And uh, all my build automation was done in a library called Albacore. And Albacore is, uh, is basically um, extensions on Rake itself uh, to allow for mm -hmm. building .NET applications. Um, at that point in time, like .NET didn't have anything, like you wrote batch files or used Visual Studio, there was no form of like CI or continuous integration. So my Ruby experience is actually not through Rails. I have it's funny when I interview or like go to consoles, they say, how much Rails experience do you have? I'm like, um, none. I mean, I've done like <laughs> here and there, I've built a website in Rails and Sinatra. And they're like, but you do Ruby? I'm like, yeah, I do Ruby. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but all my experience was through uh, build automation. And then I found out it, you just, you get like the pure Ruby experience because um, yeah, you just write functions and suddenly those functions you can leverage in a production environment to like, query what the system looks like and the automation stories were just so beautiful and then you start getting into the other intricacies of the language and then comparing and then me comparing it back to c-sharp i'm going why am i writing so much why why am i putting myself through so much pain with with a so uh, much boilerplate so mm. much boilerplate uh so much uh the whole aspect of essence versus ceremony so much ceremony and um at that point i had like uh over a three-year period in 2013, I had such a such a crisis of like uh, identity that I actually quit my job and went on a sabbatical. And I just said, I'm on a sabbatical. I'm going to do something to just disconnect from the corporate corporate uh, corporate America, the corporate world building like tax software and C sharp and uh, all that mm -hmm. fantastic stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to do my own thing. And then um, that's when I uh, found a uh, darkroom. It was a web-based game built by Michael Townsend, and I called him uh, i uh, emailed him and said hey i want to i want to build this thing um for as a mobile app and uh if we make any money we'll split the profit um so i uh, picked up a uh, a framework called ruby motion and uh, mm -hmm. ruby motion is a ruby runtime um built by a laurent it was it was actually built by apple and then um laurent sanzanetti took uh quit apple and actually extended extended that runtime to uh, from Mac Ruby into Ruby motion and you could build native iOS applications using using Ruby and uh, I was like okay I'm gonna do that <laughs> Why not? and uh, checks and, all uh, the boxes I learned yeah I learned Ruby and mobile dev not, again not rails um, and uh, ended up building uh, porting a dark room uh, to to mobile and then adding my own uh, intricacies and pacing and storyline and my own touch to the game and then out of nowhere four months later it it sh goes viral um you end up getting twenty thousand downloads a day uh you don't mm -hmm. you're not prepared to see 20, 20 grand show up in your bank account every day wow uh, it's 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 i didn't sleep for a month i mean it was in the number one spot for for about 23 days and uh that kind of kick-started my uh my world as an indie game dev, and then uh, became good friends with Laurent Sansonetti. And in uh, 2016, uh, Laurent's, Laurent was ready to retire uh, with his successes, and I acquired uh, the platform. And then I was like, okay, we can do iOS and Android, but can we extend this to everything, 
to desktop, to console, to web, to mm. the rest of the world. And um, 29, uh, 2019 is uh, when, when that uh, reality came to, came to fruition. So a whole lot of luck. Um, I have complete crapshoot, complete uh, like uh, lottery ticket winner kind of thing. But mm. um, I'm trying to I'm trying to build upon you know build upon some of those uh, some of those uh, uh, strokes of luck and uh, try to keep things going. And I just love the language. It's it's really nice. Yeah. Was uh, so, oh sorry. Go ahead, Joe. No, please. I was just going to ask is was game development something that was always in the back of your mind or was it kind of just trying to go on like the very opposite of the spectrum of what your previous work was like? Yeah, I think I think uh, that it's a common story they hear with with programmers is a, a lot of people want to get into programming because of game devs. They want to build a game. You know, they mm -hmm. see they see a game being shown. And they're like, OK, I can totally do this. And then they find it's a little bit harder than they, than they <laughs> thought it was originally, but um, you know I've always done like game jams and and like little little hackathons here and there, and um, I did uh, I've I love games I'm a gamer at heart um, I have every all the consoles all the games that you know and nice. uh, just a typical like millennial kind of uh, kind of upbringing, and uh, I mean that's the dream right I, I get to I get to code games. And the great thing about it is that uh, it's it's not tax software. <laughs> <laughs> the key component to it all, yeah. There's a lot of freedom there too. Yeah, it's it's not tax software. It's uh, it's the stuff of dreams, right? You can you can mm -hmm. decide, you know, the world you want to create, and it's it, it goes well with the language itself. I see, I see like statically typed languages as kind of um, if you think of it like as an artist, a static to type language is like working with marble. And you know you chip away at something, and then you break part of you, you break part of your sculpture, and suddenly, you know it's it's difficult. Uh, you can do good, great things with it, but it's it's so so challenging. And Ruby is more like working with oil paints or charcoal. You can you can kind of explore. You can kind of create like very very quick uh, sketches of what you want to build, and then evolve without ever mm -hmm. having to you know take take the full plunge into making a full full blown class i could use i could do a bare function i can you know have a module or it could just be a data structure with hashes and there's no there's there's no like requirement from the language saying that you must tell me what this thing is before you write it out and for for tax software i guess it works because it's well defined but for a game see i don't know what i'm building i'm building this <laughs> player that can you know do a backflip and then time travel like maybe <laughs> yeah. so ruby gave uh, ruby gives you that that feeling of you know you can you can decide uh, as you go and as you prototype something it's a it's a it had a really good feeling with with games and stuff mm. but yeah game dev i mean yeah. i don't want to write, write tech software when i'm <laughs> no yeah on my sabbatical we have some comments from the chat it's a uh, uh, server mic is off i think i can hear you mine can you guys hear me Sure, sure. Uh, I can hear you, Danny. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can't we hear you can either. Hear I think my headphones are broken. Oh, Amir can't hear us. That's great. That's great. It works <laughs> on my machine. Let me let me try using my Mac Mac speakers. <laughs> How about I'm now? Take a minute before we go in. Can you hear me I now? Can't hear you. I'm gonna talk a little bit. So, like, Danny, I actually want to. I'm gonna rejoin the call, and I'll be right back. Amir, some questions about mm -hmm. like the different runtimes because i think normally when we think about languages we think about them in terms of like the language and the runtime paired together and they're only oh, no. operating together but there's actually a lot of different runtimes for ruby including ones that like groovy and stuff like that where mm -hmm. it's like it runs on a java runtime and things like that and i want to ask about the differences between like building that for switch and other things because a language is a specification in addition to like its runtime yeah yeah absolutely definitely there we go, Amir. <laughs> For a second, it was just me into different squares. I'm going to preferences. I'm going to audio, test speakers. Da, 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 da. I can hear you now. Can... Yay. Yay! Technology. Question. This is why I build video games. <laughs> <laughs> Fair 
can't get sued for uh, sued for video games. Like no no lives or paychecks are on uh, are at risk. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I guess unless you're uh, cyberpunk, you can get unless sued. you're cyberpunk. Yeah. yeah. None of those came through though, did they? I don't know. The I just heard they get sued. Yeah. No, I think they just. I don't know. People were angry. Like they, yeah. People were angry. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to ask about like the combination of a language specification and a runtime. Because I think normally yes. when we think about languages, we think about them as pair, right? Like Ruby right. is a thing and it runs. But in your case, you're actually like you're running it on a different runtime, like kind of like yes. Ruby does, right? Yeah. So the, the tricky part is that it, you'll always hear this, like uh, Ruby is slow. And I'm like, a language can't be slow. A language is a language spec. Uh, which Ruby are you talking about? Are you talking about JRuby? Are you talking about MRI? Are you talking about Truffle, Artichoke, Dragon Ruby? Uh, which Ruby are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And um, that that uh, separation is is important because you've got your language specification and then the implementation of the language. Um, I like a specific. Can can you all like show videos or anything? I can I can give you all a link real quick. Yeah, yeah. you can. Um, I'll, I'll post a YouTube link somewhere in, and I guess the zoom chat and if you, you can, uh, correlate it over, I guess. Yeah. I got you. Um, so just like a simple example, um, I always, uh, I always How pick on this YouTube video. I'm sorry. How long is this YouTube video? It's, it's very short. It's just a demonstration. Okay. And, uh, what it is, is, um, it's a demonstration, uh, cause I'll always hear, well, Ruby is slow. And I go, well, what do you mean? Ruby is slow. Ruby is language. I say, well, C sharp's definitely faster. A lot of the uh, a lot of the devs that I uh, work with, especially in the game uh, game development world, use Unity and C sharp. That's a that's a big player in the game industry. And I go, well, yes, C sharp is a language, and Unity is the runtime, and Unity's implementation of C sharp is slower than slower than Dragon Ruby. Um, so what the YouTube video shows is that if you like scroll to, towards the very end, I show rendering of sprites on the screen, and uh, uh, with uh, with Dragon Ruby, I'm rendering twenty thousand sprites at sixty frames per second. Uh, with Unity's C sharp runtime, C sharp language specification, Unity runtime, it can't do that. And so, you know, it comes down to is like, well, uh, that that separation is really important. And um, uh, right now, the the challenge is that the only big player in in the Ruby world is MRI Ruby or C Ruby, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there's there's very little separation between between the language and the runtime, they become one and the same. And so uh, educating people and letting them know is like, well, there's a runtime implementation mm -hmm. um, and then there's the language spec. So Dragon Ruby uses a, a, a language spec uh, for Ruby. Um, it's based off of the uh, MRuby uh, parse structure of the language. And um, its runtime is, is not, it's not C Ruby, it's not MRuby, it's not, JRuby or anything. It's a it's a run runtime customized to work on mobile, web, console, desktop, PC, Mac, Linux. Um, and uh, there were a lot of things that we changed inside the standard lib, inside of uh, the the core libraries as a whole that define what this what this runtime is. And so um, educating people around that is has been you know it's it's a it's something that is a People just haven't, you know, been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that, that's the general uh, aspect of what's the difference between a language and a runtime. Mm -hmm. For those of us who have never had the pleasure of like creating our own runtime, um, can you talk a little bit about some of the technical challenges that you face there? Sorry, this is just really interesting uh, for me because I don't meet yeah, a lot of yeah. people who've like so, done this before. <laughs> so, so think about it. Think about it. Uh, so it's kind of, it's kind of like. Uh, repeating history in, the, in in regard to, you know, Matsumoto had to do this. And now uh, I'm being put in a position where it's like, okay, I got to do this, but for chipset architectures that ha were never, were never uh, meant to be targeted. So like uh, an example of uh, creating the runtime, um, one of the challenges uh, with creating a runtime is that you have to get good with C. Um, mm -hmm. And um, an example would be like, if you look at, just cloning cloning uh, Ru uh, C Ruby and trying to get it to compile is is a question. It's like, okay, well, I can get it to compile, fantastic. Now, how do I change one of the core libraries? How do I change uh, file? 
because mm -hmm. of because uh, file and dir are uh, are uh, OS level specific things. They're not written in Ruby. They're written in straight C. So then, that's one aspect. It was like, okay, well, uh, I have to get I have to make file APIs in Dragon Ruby work across con uh, across um, operating systems that don't even have a concept of a file system. Like, there's cons consoles don't give you ls or durstat or some of these like standard library c libraries that you get so you're rewriting some of these like core aspects to it and then additionally uh, with regards to runtime uh, you have to start thinking about what does this runtime look like so uh, with regards to uh, with regards to uh, ruby ruby's runtime and its threading model is is uh, you execute a script and it invokes invokes the ruby script and then you could potentially have some container that keeps the application alive and then mm -hmm. uh, the threading model is you using thread, right? You use thread dot do and then provide your invocation there. But Dragon Ruby is different in that uh, the execution model is actually an event loop. It, it I, I took uh, ideas from other languages and lessons learned from other languages. So uh, Node.js had this concept of an event loop, and, uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, I think Dragon Ruby is going to have this. So when you run a script in Dragon Ruby, the 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 script runs. In an event loop, so if you do puts hello world, it will put at sixty uh, at sixty hertz, mm -hmm. and you're just like, this this is weird. <laughs> like, what is going on here? But um, it's because of the event loop. And the thing the thing with uh, Dragon Ruby is that because of this event loop, uh, similar with Node.js, is that you have you now have the ability to uh, to rethink how asynchronicity occurs. So in Dragon Ruby, when you make an HTTP request, it's async. And what happens is that you invoke the request, you get this object back that has a status of whether it's completed or not. So there's no callback or there's no promise, there's no callback, there's nothing like that. And the beauty of that is because you know that this thing is gonna come re-enter into this top level message pump. Mm -hmm. So you come in and then you can check the status to see if the HTTP request is completed and then perform some action based on that. So uh, those are a those, that's another aspect of a runtime that you, can think, that you have to think about is that What's the execution model? What's the async model? So uh, Dragon Ruby doesn't really have threads. It's it's all through this single synchronization context, and you use polling um, to to determine if you know uh, a job or a specific task is completed or not. And that's because you're solving a different problem, right? One of the things that I've noticed about game design is typically like you have the concept of like this massive wow loop that everything yep. else runs inside. And Ruby yep. was really like. At its roots, it's a scripting language, right? And Rails right. went and they took it and they were like, we're gonna use this to make like classes and all of these structures and all of these objects and you're gonna call on these and call methods from them. And I'm yep. gonna build this domain specific language. But from game design, you have a completely different approach to problem solving than either scripting like, than just like a pure, I'm gonna yep. start at the top and run to the bottom script yep. or like a web framework. Like I yes. often see um, a heavy focus on like attributes and tracking mm -hmm. like the user's this is maybe a little bit impacted by the fact that I like relationship games and stuff like that. And they'll typically track like your influence with a character <laughs> <laughs> through different events. But like, that's what I kind of see when I hear game designers talk about their work. Yep. And the other, the other aspect of it is that this is, um, these are, this runtime has, has a, an aspect of it being a long running process. So while, while in rails, you have a, you, your controls are ephemeral, right? They get created. They invoke the action, and then they're torn down to be, you know, to be reinitialized. That's why your state management is either done through cookies or like Redis or you know some kind of non-volatile storage. But when it comes to yeah, when it comes to uh, game dev and thick client applications, you have a long you have long running state, so you, you you can just set a property and it's there and it lives. <laughs> and it's like, what do you mean it's just there? It's like yeah, it, it stays around. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> for the whole game session and then it gets yeah, saved to a file yeah and it's great and so um those aspects of it are in there the, the really interesting thing and some of the premise around uh, dragon ruby uh and it's worth mentioning is that um dragon ruby is is a is a zero dependency cross-platform runtime you download the zip file you double click the exe that's it you don't need to have mri installed you don't need to have any the installation process is X copy deployable. So the beauty of that is that your, you know, your dependency chain to get started is, is nothing. And imagine like taking a Dragon Ruby script 
and a Dragon Ruby runtime, and then putting on like an EC2 instance. So you're not having to provision anything. You just you just copy the zip file over, unzip it, and then uh-huh. that's it. There's there's no there's no apt get. There's no brew install. There's no compilation. It's just uh, self-contained. It's just okay. Yeah. I would love to know more about why you decided to implement it that way, but I have been struggling with Docker for the past two months on various solutions, and I'm just like, that sounds amazing. Yes, and the the uh, the Dragon Ruby is actually compiled. It's an it becomes an, a Windows EXE, a Mac app, a mm-hmm. Linux binary, or an iOS app. So when you say you know run this run this game, you double click, you know you just double click and it starts up the environment and you've got a game right there. So, um, so yeah, those are those are the kind of uh, considerations, and that's the beauty of it. Is that it's not only about game development; it's it's a it's a it's taking all the things that we've learned about Ruby over the past twenty five years, and all the things that all the other languages have done well, and a Dragon Ruby is an opportunity to say we don't have we don't have a responsibility to maintain compatibility because this is a new runtime, this is a new environment. Let's break things. Let's <laughs> re envision Ruby how we want it to look like and uh, see what that looks like. And so um, here we are. I mean, you've got an environment that doesn't require an installer and uh, is X copy deployed and um, can work on anything, even even the web. Uh, if you go to like fiddle.dragonruby.org, that is the runtime, the Dragon Ruby runtime in a browser. And you can change, uh, we got an editor where you can change code and then see it update live in the browser and everything's hot loaded too so it's just uh it's wild that uh you know it's good that we have uh, dragon ruby has the opportunity to say you know we don't have to worry about breaking because no one's built any apps except for uh, the people that have been using uh, the runtime for you know for mobile and android development and we can uh we can push the language forward in a different way mm-hmm. I'm seeing a lot of comments saying like uh, Dragon Ruby is sounding amazing. And then people are like, "Uh, because it is, it's, it's fun. Yeah. (laughs) Freaking awesome. Uh, Akira and Kadiko has a question here. Like uh, what versions of the language does it follow? So you mentioned in Ruby before, I think Mm -hmm. this is probably related to some of the changes we're seeing in Ruby three. That's at least the question I've been like avoiding asking. Right. So um, we're, we're targeting, uh, the ISO the ISO standard for uh, I think like 1.8 compatibility. So if you go to um, if you look at MRuby, they have like about MRuby, and the reason I re- reference MRuby is that that's that's kind of like our polyfill at the top level of the runtime. And I can go into detail about some of the techniques that we use to support all these other languages. Please. And, and <laughs> uh, so we we start with MRuby, and MRuby's uh, intention is to have um, an ISO compatible Ruby. Uh, I think it's like 1.8 compatibility. So what that means is that um, uh, we don't have the 3.0 uh, language features, and uh, and so and this is a good this is a good um, uh, separation. It's like we're we're finally talking about what is the language spec versus what is the runtime. So right now we don't have compatibility with uh, Ruby's um, uh, Ruby's uh, language spec as it as it exists today, um, and a part of that is by de- design because the evolution of Ruby 3.0 is. Um, is informed by not breaking, not breaking exi- existing applications. Uh, for for Dragon Ruby, we have a bit more liberty about you know what that looks like. Uh, so like uh, I'm gonna just post a sample, uh, just a quick thing in chat. So you've got like if you've got an object, uh, you have to use instance variable git, right? Instance variable git, and then you give it a property like name, right? But in Dragon Ruby, I can explore doing this, and this is actually stolen from uh, uh, stolen from Crystal. Um, I can do that. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm dropping it in the mm-hmm. uh, Twitch chat here. And so the thing is, is that you have this you have this uh, subset compatibility that you want to target, but I don't want to be constrained by that, and I also don't want to be seen as um, like a, a like a, a follower or just a tail of MRI because that's not the intention of this. The intention of this is to have a, a renaissance and a revitalization of of Ruby and what uh, learning all the things that we've learned before, right? 
So object of name. And then uh, if you wanted to get a method pointer in Ruby, the challenge there is that because uh, parentheses are optional, we have to call the additional like dot method aspect to it, right? So, but uh, with this with this uh, with this uh, additional language access, maybe this becomes a method pointer. And then, the, and from a language spec, this is not compatible with with C Ruby, right? No. Um, and that's okay. People have questions. Sort of, <laughs> like, wait, hold what on. Sort of, <laughs> what sort of documentation issues does this start to raise? Because you have your own independent spec, so instead of saying like, "Oh, you can go look at the Ruby docs in order to see how this right. works," you're maintaining your own language spec as well. Correct. Yeah, it's it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> you're like I'm, that, that's a that's a, it is a that is a problem um so we generally try to stay compatible um a lot of the a lot of the uh, questions that come around language compatibility is is well i want to use an mri gem and i want to leverage an MR, mri gem and i've struggled with this because there are times where i'm like show me the mri gem you want to use and they'll say no cook it's like well we've got xml built in that's in our core lib like, uh -huh. think about all the things that Nokugiri offers. What's really the only thing that you use out of Nokugiri? It's like, and do you want to actually try to, I'll be lucky if I can do a gem install in Nokugiri and not have it fail the first time uh, using using native compilations. So we're just, we thought it was like, well, we're just going to build some of the Nokugiri capabilities in, so you don't have to use the Nokugiri gem. Um, there are other, the other challenges is that uh, when I'm looking at Ruby and the future of the language, uh, the gems and the world of gems is a, is a walled garden. We've got beautiful gems, but the uh, the bus factor as far as supporting and open source and all that is just, uh, given the general populace of what's out there. It's just a smaller it's a smaller group of people. So with Dragon Ruby, our uh, our motive, our um, recommendation is to look at look at other libraries, and the other libraries that we want you to look at are C libraries. And so you want you want something that parses JSON uh, or YAML. Don't look at the YAML gem. Look at libyaml that was written for C because everything uses that. And then we have we have a uh, um, integrations with C extensions that allows you to basically point to a header file and say, create a Ruby object that I can use to invoke these C libraries. So now if you think about if you take the number of gems you lose from MRI, that's a lot. But if you replace that by the number of C libraries that you have access to now um, in a trivial fashion, uh, I think that's a that's a decision that's worth making. <laughs> right? So you can Some try to... Box42 you... asked about my magic. Yeah. So, I mean, you can, you can like an example is that we don't have vector in a Dragon Ruby. Um, and the reason we don't have the vector type in Dragon Ruby is because there's a C type SIMD, which is the fundamental vector type that that the entire world of matrix multiplication is, is uh, computed around. Use use the matrix libraries that exist in C because they are going to be more widely supported. They're going to be wa more widely maintained. They're going to have more GitHub stars. They're going to have that um, uh, that uh, precedence that no Ruby gem is going to have. So that's kind of how we uh, how we uh, um, think about you know the compatibility issues, but it's a hard problem. Yeah. We've got docs at dragonruby.org and um, come to the Discord. There's a lot of people that'll help you. We've got 60 some odd samples inside of the download. So uh, you can look at uh, a lot of the sample apps and um, yeah, it's a hard problem. <laughs> Ruby. It's a hard problem. That's my desk. I lose sleep at night dealing with this problem. Yeah, when you said I didn't, I didn't sleep for a couple of days once uh, the dark room launched. It seems like you still don't sleep. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I, I tell everyone in the Discord that I occasionally seg fault, so I'll I'll be like, it's like everyone says, Amir, do you even sleep? And then I'm gone for like a week trying to recharge, and then and then I come back. So I'm just I'm just a computer program that occasionally seg faults. I don't sleep. <laughs> Uh, Sunfox42 has a question. How much of your time is spent on Dragon Ruby versus making video games? Uh, so the good news is that um, it's, it, I go, kind of go in cycles. So game dev is a feast and famine kind of thing. So you build a game, you have all the pre-production aspects of it in your release, and then um, you think of your next idea. 
So during the thinking of the next idea, I'm working on uh, I'm working on Dragon Ruby stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, the the whole aspect of like I have six properties now, so I have to think about sustainability as a as like an indie developer, as like a micro company or a small company. Um, I don't want to hire people uh, in that in, in that because they're not going to be invested like like I would be um, in the things that I build. So how do you how do you self starters or bootstrappers maintain the velocity that they originally had when they have six properties up there? And the answer is, is that you end up building a runtime in a language, <laughs> so you can <laughs> so you can continue to go fast. And so um, half my time is built uh, is done uh, doing video games, and half my time is Dragon Ruby. So I guess it's like fifty fifty, but everything that I have to Dragon Ruby is is something that I'll be able to take advantage of when I'm going back to my to my game dev aspect of it. Mm. So um, it varies. Uh, beginning of the year is mostly game dev. End of the year is mostly get Dragon Ruby. Ah, is that is there a reason for that, or it just kind of falls in that light or way? No, or it's it... because of Apple Christmas. It's because all the new devices and chips and <laughs> M1 processors and silicon and new consoles that come out, we have to support them. Mm. So if you think about like uh, the PS5 coming out, there there's another like chipset architecture that's there. Um, there's another compilation stream. There's there's uh, all the SDKs SDKs that we have to make sure we have compatibility for. We got to make sure our file access on this new proprietary OS actually works. Mm. So uh, we we have to we have to go in those cycles when when new hardware and chips come out. We're more on the Dragon Ruby side, and then the beginning of the year, everyone's you know kind of like relaxing. Now, are you able to tell us what you're currently working on? Is there an, is there Dark Room Two coming out or? Well, I'm I'm porting a lot of my uh, a lot of my mobile assets to to the Nintendo Switch, mm. so I'm working on those things. Um, I have a couple of games in pre-production, which you can like see on my itch play, itch page, and uh, those those properties are kind of uh, you you can kind of think of it as like demo tapes for like singers and stuff like. That. So these are pre-production aspects of it. There are artifacts from game jams, so I use game jams to kind of like vet ideas. So uh, if I do a game jam and uh, find that uh, the the rating or you know my rank in the in the jam was really high and I got good feedback, that's a candidate for something that I would turn into like you know a real uh, something that can be monetized. Um, but if it wasn't a good idea, then I'm just like okay, well then you know we'll reiterate and try it in another game jam. Is it itch.io? So, it's a great way to feel faster. Yeah, amirrajan.itch.io. Uh, wait, what is itch? What is it? So itch is uh, itch is uh, a competitor to Steam, um, and uh, itch is centered around, uh, I guess, sustainable sustainable monetization. I guess um, it allows indies to uh, publish their games there, and uh, you can decide how much royalty you want to give itch based on based on your stuff. And it it's more of a collaboration between you know the company uh, itch and the indies themselves, and um, uh, that's that's where I host a lot of my uh, a lot of my um, little things. There's a couple of questions in chat. Uh, your bird crab wants to know if you're off your 10 day break. I am off my 10 day break, but I'm working on the next release of uh, of uh, Dragon Ruby. So with the next release, we actually we actually have an embedded web server. So, and again, this is zero dependency. So you start a Dragon Ruby. And you can, you, you this event loop that exists can uh, has a has a property in there that says, are there any HTTP requests? So then you can actually process the HTTP request, write something to the pipe, and then have a HTTP response. And again, this is a, this is you don't need a web server, you don't need Apache, Nginx, uh, Brick, WebBrick, uh, Unicorn, or any of that. You just start up the thing, and you have a web server in-house running on inside of the process itself so is a lot um, of that because you've like built that in yeah yeah we built it in um uh, and it's because of that event loop that we have because of our async model we can uh your response it, it's not a production uh, level uh web server but when you're doing like a local multiplayer game where you want to do peer-to-peer -peer on a you know on your like local lan it's perfect you've got a you've got your server that acts as a client and you've got eight people connected to it that can play a multiplayer game locally you know, it's a really uh, interesting uh, approach to that. So that's what I'll be. That, yes, I'm off my 10-day break, but I'm working on uh, the that big release. 
Fuzzy Drumming wants to know if one of the games you're working on is the Stickman drawing posted on Discord. Uh, apparently that had a very compelling storyline. Can you tell us a little bit about the Stickman game? Yeah, so the Stickman game, it's a, um, it's a low-res walking simulator. Um, mm -hmm. And so a walking simulator, that term, that coin was termed because of Firewatcher. The Fire, uh, Firewatch was a game. Oh, Firewatch. Oh my gosh, I love that game. It's a beautiful game. So that's, that was coined, that coined the term walking simulator. Mm. So I created a low res version, version of that in that um, the game is rendered at 64 by 64 pixels. That's it. That's all the pixels I have access to me. And it's a storyline based off of um, uh, basically Haley's comet or a comet hit, uh, hit the earth and uh, killed off 99.9% .9 of the population. And the only reason that earth didn't go extinct was because of Mission Serenity, which was a, a ship, uh, like a, a spaceship and a, a team of people that deflected part of the comet from, from hitting the planet. So everyone thought that they died, but it turns out that they were just in stasis for 20 years. So when you get contacted by them, they were thinking they're gonna come back in a year, but now it's 20 years later and they're like, hey guys, um, we're ready for re-entry. And they don't realize that it's been 20 years later. So you're in the situation where you have to communicate to them how do you communicate to them that, you know, what like moral implications exist for communicating to them that, you know, this time has passed and also you're helping them trying to fix their ship to bring them back to earth. Um, and so, because they're on the ship, they don't know that like 99% of the earth's population has been destroyed. Yep. And 20 years has passed. So one of the ship members actually, um, actually left, uh, left his wife who was, who turned out to be pregnant with his child. And now the child's 20 years old. Like, how do you break that? Do you break that news over, you know, how much do you tell them truthfully versus let them come back to Earth and then they're on Earth? And, and I can find this in rebuild? your Discord? Huh? And I can find this game in your Discord? I'm going to look for it. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's called... Cool. Uh, As I join the Discord right now. <laughs> it's, called a return, it's called a Return of uh, Serenity. Mm -hmm. And it's on, it's on the itch page. That sounds beautiful. Um, Picando and Kadigo wants to know if you've checked out the Pico 8. The Pico 8. I love Pico. Oh, Pico. I love Pico 8. Um, the challenge and one of the one of the reasons why I built Dragon Ruby was because of uh, the value prop of Pico 8. Celeste uh, is a game. I, I don't know if you all know about Celeste. Love Celeste. But Celeste was a was actually a game jam game written in Pico 8. So uh, they the developers of the game saw that Celeste had this. Uh, you know, it was a viable product based on the results they got from the game jam. And now they're in this situation where they built out this prototype in Pico 8, but they can't take it to the finish line and get it on console and mobile and web and Steam and desktop because Pico 8 isn't designed for that. So what do they have to do? They have to throw out everything and then they rewrote it in Unity. And so for me, I want people to be able to start in Dragon Ruby, prototype something quickly Vet a, vet a prototype and then take that same runtime in that same environment and take it all the way to the finish line. Um, so I think Pico 8 is a phenomenal prototyping tool and uh, it's, it's, a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful constrained um, environment. But I want, I want to be able to help indies and developers build sustainable income that doesn't require them to build tax off of. And uh, that's important. So, Very I post attack software. Yeah, yeah. Down with that. Your next game is going to be how you destroy <laughs> the tax software industry. <laughs> I swear, man. Taxes. You would think that taxes are They're logical. So They're not. They're not logical. <laughs> I was working on sales tax before I like came over to um, this current job with uh, New Relic and Devrel, and it was it was crazy because like you would have different amounts based on the day because you'd have tax holidays. It's like special jurisdictions, like. Yeah, and a jurisdiction layers. isn't hierarchical. Mm -mm. It's crazy. You have you have your state, uh, you have your state tax, uh, your federal, state, city, and jurisdiction can span cities. And then you ask someone to deterministically tell you what the value, like an accountant determines to tell you what your tax burden is if you're across two jurisdictions. And they're like, it depends. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean it depends? <laughs> it depends on if you get audited or not. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> I have nightmares. I want to ask you, because we were talking about domain specific languages earlier, and you were like, I want this XML parser, so I built it. I want this like web server, so mm -hmm. I built it. 
I want to ask like what are some of the methods and like some of the domain specific language that you've built up around Dragon Ruby to have easy access to these things? So that, that's a good question. So um, I'm standing on the uh, the shoulders of giants. Uh, when it comes to rendering, all of our rendering is done through uh, libsdl2. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with libsdl. Uh, uh, it was it's a um, Valve. Everything in Valve, everything in Steam, um, your your Nintendo, your your micro consoles, you know, you're like those mini consoles that everyone puts out. The entire world is powered by SDL, Simple Direct mm -hmm. Media Layer. And so when it came to rendering, uh, we use LibSDL, and we just leverage that. Uh, when it comes to file access, we use PhysFS, which is a, a cross-platform uh, file access system. When it came to HTTP, we use libcurl. Mm. Uh, when it comes to um, there was there was a, a HTTP and um, yeah I mean we just is there a C library for this the answer is always yes <laughs> oh for for like uh, XML parsing we use we use libxml for YAML or JSON we use you know like a JSON library a lightweight JSON parser so uh, standing on the shoulders of giants based on that and um, with regards to the D DSL. Uh, a lot of the DSL is this single, um, this single like environment variable that's sent into your message, in, into your event loop. So when your event loop comes in, you're given this effectively a module or class. And from there, you can access all of these um, OS specific out of process level communication stuff. So our DSL is actually very data oriented. So um, very, very few use of classes. It's all arrays, arrays, hashes, uh, tuples and, ver and serializable data structures. And so the simplicity of that saying like, this thing accept a, accepts a hash with these properties. And if you don't pr provide them, we don't worry about rendering it. So if you want to render a sprite, you, you have this entry level object, you do outputs dot sprites and you give it a hash. And the hash has X, Y, width, height and path. Wow. And that's our mm -hmm. DSL. And, um, and, and that's kind of how we did it. Um, it's very, very data oriented. And uh, everything is serializable, persistible to disk. Um, the benefit of that is that when you have an exception, I can dump that entire environment to your uh, to your uh, to your uh, system, and you've got it available, and uh, you can see exactly what went wrong in a stack trace. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's how we approach the DSL. That's really interesting because it. Because when I think about it, you talked about it being serializable. I assume that also has to do with like saving the environment. Yes. Because that's a big part of games. It's like saving yes. the player's current status and the decision tree that they followed. Yep, that's correct. Um, the other interesting aspect of it is that this is something that we're we're stealing from Closure. Um, again, like learning from the languages that, uh, that have done things right, is that we're working on a persisted hash, and the persisted hash allows you to. Um, not only store the current serializable state of the hash, but also historically everything that happened in that hash. Oh. So now when an exception occurs, I don't get the current state, I get everything leading up to that exception. So I can rewind the, the point in time in, in a game mm -hmm. and watch it do the exception and then rewind again. Mm. So um, yeah. How does that this balance hash out data with memory? Huh? How does that balance out on the memory side of things? So the, the beautiful thing is that there was a white paper that was written um, in 20, uh, 20, 2005 and then, and then additionally, uh, additionally uh, updated um, around 2012, 2015. And this, this data structure is, and the internal, the internal aspects of the data structure actually make it just as performant. We can store 14 million value, uh, key values and versions in this hash in under like 20 megabytes of, of, of data. And wow. there's a precedence already set, Git does this, right? Git mm -hmm. does this with text. And when you save a, when you, when you save a property, you're not copying the entire file. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a local, changes. it's the local changes. So we've effectively just done that, but for hashes. Wow, that is really that cool. That makes sense. So you're not storing the entire hash. You're storing the changes that have occurred to it. Correct. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Fuzzy drumming just goes, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like with your corporate applications, uh, I'm sure you have to like uh, record telemetry. Um, mm. Did they go to this page? Did they go to that page? Et cetera, et cetera, right? You have your log statements and stuff like that. 
Well, think about the persistent hash. If my entire app state is stored in the hash, I can retroactively get any metrics I need because I already have the entire history of how that app has transformed over a period over a given session. So there's no telemetry. The telemetry is the actual app state. I just have to serialize that and send it to the server. You can see that. You can also see that being a little hard to search. Oh, well, you can search Git. You do a Git bisect. And you visualize the hash data structures at any point in time, right? So you, 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 reset, you reset your commit history all the way back to the beginning. And then you just look at your commits over time. Danny, what are you doing? This is my head exploding right now. I'm just like... You, you just look at the source code, right? You yeah. just check out a commit. And you look yeah. at the state, and then you check out the next commit and look at the state. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I want to say yes, but I don't even know. I don't even know if you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you could invert that, and it would be just as good, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so multiplayer becomes interesting, too, because now you don't have to run your uh, a dedicated server that, that invokes the game logic. Because your multiplayer ends up being commoditized, all you're doing is making sure the same state makes it to all the clients mm -hmm. in the right order. That's it. That's so cool. And you're just sending changes to all of them. That's it. Packet loss. Packet loss can happen, but because it's but because the change history, as far as the serialization mechanism, is um, is effectively you can. You can get a packet loss, and then when the next request comes in to push down history, the client can say, I need history from this point forward. Because it never got it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is happening at 60. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for a multiplayer game, you're looking at 10 hertz. So it's happening 10 times a second. This is what lag is, right? But at 10 times a second, you're the packets that are lost you know, do, end, do eventually end, end up getting caught up. The, on, mm -hmm. the only other additional aspect to getting the centralized commoditized multiplayer server is the idea of which happened first. And there's another white paper. Um, it's called Lamport's uh, Logical Clock Algorithm. And it's based off of distributed systems uh, where, where he explains how you determine the, the point in time where two distributed systems created an action. Was it before or after at the same time? So with the addition of the logical clock and the game state, you've got this. You've got the mechanisms needed for uh, for your clients to resolve merge conflicts. So if you think about a merge conflict, you've got two states that are different. Well, we resolve merge conflicts in Git all the time. In a game, merge conflicts are well defined. They're discrete in that you know that if you got a block by Chun Li and a and a fireball coming in from Ryu, and they <laughs> all both happen at the same time, you can resolve that merge conflict deterministically given, given the context of your, of your game logic. So it's effectively source control for a hash with merge conflict resolution being done intelligently by each client. And by doing that, you don't need a server. You, you have a commoditized instance of the server. I, I just want to pivot real quick. Obviously, with you breaking this down, it's so, like so technical and it's like you're diving really deep into all these different concepts and you have to have this deep understanding of so many things. Does it do your parents just think you play video games and just make my parents? <laughs> my parents. Uh, uh, do you know that the, uh, there, there was that one like meme going around where uh, they're in the you're like in a plane and there's someone having a heart attack mm -hmm. and then the parent looks over and is like, oh, you know, you would have been able to help this person with a heart attack. Right. Yes. Right. Yes, yes. I'm right. I I get that. I connect with that on such a personal level where like Yeah, so for me uh it's oh, you're game dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my dad is from Iran and my mom is from Mexico and I'm like, "Oh, no." Man, when Satya when Sati became CEO, every every South Asian male screamed at their talk of their lungs because you know that every parent said, "Why aren't you the CEO?" Why aren't you CEO? Why aren't you're not do you're you're not you're not a doctor? You're not a doctor. Why aren't you CEO? Yeah, it is so yeah. Dude, when I, uh, no. I when I just got when I went to code school last year, and now when I got this job, my the first thing my dad goes to me, 
will your business card say engineer on it? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, okay, my son, my son, the engineer. I have to show you my business card. Oh my God. <laughs> What does it say? Try pulling it. Uh, the code right may or may not work. <laughs> <laughs> the code or right may or may not work. That is what my business card says. That I is like so it. funny. I like it a lot. That's fun. My dad continually refers to what I do as my podcast. <laughs> Even before I did podcasts. My mom, oh, yeah. this is the funniest thing. I had my parents over and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm running it. Okay, so I had a bunch of goats in my yard. Don't ask me why I had 32 goats in my yard. It's a long story. <laughs> anyway, so my parents are over to come visit the goats and I've got a stream running so I can show chat all the goats and everything, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm running a stream right now. So like, I'm just going to say, be right back to them and then I'll come hang out with y'all and have lunch. So I'm going and I'm having lunch and I was like, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm streaming it on Twitch. And she's like, I have a Twitch subscription. <laughs> and I'm like, you have a Twitch subscription. And she's like, yeah, I get it for free with Amazon. And I'm like, oh, do, do you like watch things on Twitch? And she's like, no, I don't do it very often, but I have the subscription if I want to. And I'm like, oh, oh, she's thinking of the Twitch Prime subscription. And she thinks that's the exact same thing as like a subscription to Netflix that gets her access to Twitch. That's precious. <laughs> that's but like, I just want to say like, my mom was technical enough to be like, I know that I've got a Twitch subscription from Amazon and like savvy enough to know that she had the deal. <laughs> yeah, she's like, um, I'm, I'm up with the times, no big deal. <laughs> so like another another aspect uh, to, to that question, that thread is really important to me is uh, this idea of um, of art and uh, creative, creative careers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, society, to, I'm lucky that I love coding and I'm lucky that society saw coding as productive enough to where they, where I could be gainfully employed. Mm. Um, and, you know, as historically, societally, if someone said I wanted to be a ma magician, uh, their parents would say, don't do it. You're crazy. <laughs> yeah. You'll never make the money doing it. But if you think about it, every second of our leisure time is used mm -hmm. consuming art, mm -hmm. books, stuff. music um plays uh videos games uh we spend every second of 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 what we consider free time consuming the thing that we're discouraging our the next generation to to uh to pursue and mm -hmm. it's just so it's so it's so backwards mm. you know what it makes me think of my anger towards capitalism. We're gonna get a little off track, and technically <laughs> no, we're over so, time. So, so I, if we kinda... need to cut this, we can cut this. But like, yeah. well, here's what I kind of think about it. As human beings, we want to express ourselves, and art yes. is the way that we express ourselves. It's innate. Absolutely. We have a passion, a drive. That's why in our our off time, I'm trying to learn the ukulele and failing. It's why I live streamed before I was paid for it. It's why people take sabbaticals is so they can go create things because we enjoy that. We enjoy creating and expressing mm. it. And because we enjoy doing that and we're willing to do it for free, people are like, well, if you enjoy doing it and doing it for free, then I won't pay you very much for doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's that's where that's where like the taking advantage happens. Right. Yeah. Like the reason we pay people to do things is to get them to do things that they don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And I, and I and it's 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 um, it sucks. And yeah. like one of the aspects of uh, why, you know, I took all the effort of creating this in engine in this community is to is to uh, help people bootstrap even the smallest thing. It's like you're not going to make a million dollars the first day, but if you can make fifty dollars a month on this thing that took you a little bit of time to create, mm -hmm. you have your Internet connection paid for you for the rest of your life. Like. Mm -hmm. And it's these like, and the thing is, is that we have developers have the power. We have uh, the we we are the liter. Uh, I kind of think of it as like literacy back in the day when when literacy wasn't prevalent. Those that could read and write were in the upper echelon, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to development, we have the literacy of this day and age. It's why the top companies 
you know, in the United States are run by people that can code is because they have that level of literacy that they can uh, they can leverage. And um, we just got to take advantage of it. And I, I'm actually not against open source, but the way I run Dragon Ruby is that it's I call it gray source. Um, actually, one of the Discord members thought of this idea, and it's called gray source and that parts of it are open source, but parts of it are proprietary. And uh, we have no free version of Dragon Ruby. You pay. If you're gainfully employed, you are going to pay for this product. Mm -hmm. um, but we have stipulations that say if you make under 2000, 2000 a month, you'll get it for free. If you're a teacher, you get it for free. If you're under 18, you get it for free. If you're a parent that wants to teach their kid how to code, you get it for free. But um, if you are gainfully employed, you are paying for this. And if you are gain if you want the pro features like the you know embedded web server or like the C extensions, you're going to pay for it. I mean, we're in the top five percent earners in the entire world. You're paying for this. You're you're paying for this thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it was a lot for people to uh, you know kind of come to grasp for, and they say, well, these other things are free, and open source is free. And I tell them it's not sustainable. People burn out. You know, you've got open source maintainers that are barely making anything off of their like sponsorships. And, um, you know, they're required to deal with all these demands and I'm not doing that. Right. I and I wouldn't want you to do that. I think there is yeah, some really connection there between like being a creative person and knowing your like value and how much work you put Absolutely. into put yeah. into something. It's like how many times have I been asked? Like the things that you two have said, it's like hits my soul because it's like I've been doing like theater productions and stand up comedy for so long for like free just because I love it. Yeah. And now that. I can get paid to like do comedy or things like that. It's just now I understand my value and how much time and effort I put into it. So it's like, of course I'm going to tell people like, no, I want to be paid for this because yeah, you know how many hours I may be only performing for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but the amount of hours and work that has gone to this point where I could like for dragon Ruby to be here and be yeah. presentable and to have, you know, to even have the standard and professional versions. It's like, how many hours it took to get there yeah and uh it, it's tricky with software devs because we expect those things for free mm. we're like oh there's all this open source and there's all this other stuff and um it's not sustainable and the other the other interesting aspect is like you're you're using this to potentially build a product to sell and even if you're not even if it's just a hobby like i think our subscription right now uh is like 40 bucks a year like 42 dollars a year mm. um I mean, I've spent more on drawing material, like drawing materials every year. And I'm not even that, I'm not even that good. I don't do it professionally. It's just a hobby. Right? DoorDash alone last night was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so e even if it's a hobby, even if it's not like a professional thing, it's like, I mean, we spend money on hobbies all the time. Like I've got, I've got soldering irons and stuff for keyboards that I've spent, you know, I don't even want to talk about how much I spend on keyboards. <laughs> and it's, it's not a professional thing. I don't sell them, but it's a hobby that I spend money on. And so it's okay to spend money on hobbies. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation to have. And um, the, the premise is usually is like, you're, this is, this is our idea. This is the vision. This is why you're paying. And it as that buried in is like if you don't agree with the stuff then then you know don't don't pay mm -hmm. we don't want you part of this community because there's this idea that you know it putting that gate is important mm -hmm. it's important mm -hmm. especially for an early product having that foundation yeah absolutely i think I don't know. This is really cool. I I yeah. I just started messing with Unity, and I have a stream tonight, and I'm hanging out with a friend of mine who's a game developer, and I just decided to do Unity because that was the only thing I knew of. Like this opens up exactly. so many world, like so many things in my mind as having a Ruby background, and I'd never even heard about this. So yeah, this is Dude, really cool. You're gonna. Uh whatever game you're building we have a sample up for it <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know i was uh moving a per, just a pre-rendered person across the screen last week so that's pretty we, cool <laughs> we have a we have a sample uh, we have a sample app that shows you how to move a person animate mm -hmm. the sprites and then slash a sword to break to break a square oh should i just change the stream tonight to dragon root okay all right this will do. <laughs> play around with it yeah uh, yeah play around with the man you go to fiddle.dragonruby.org we actually have um a tutorial that shows you how to make a shooter 
and you can just like follow the steps live and code it and uh, wow. s- uh, see uh, build a shooter like in in uh, in the in the browser. What is that site again? Fiddle.dragonruby.org. Yeah. Okay. So wow. there's a so one of the sample apps I built was a, a was like the 3D uh, traveling through space or space at light speed. Mm-hmm. And it shows you the progression of how I was able to make that. If you like hit next all the way to the end, you can see what the final scene looks like. Oh, wow. And you can see how I how I built that. Okay. But it's a live environment that you can that you can manipulate code in and then the tutorials will walk you through the basic APIs. Oh, what? This, this is wild. Fun. This is the Ruby runtime running in a browser. <laughs> that alone was impressive. Like that alone is impressive. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This has been an incredible conversation. I loved it. Where can people find you? Um, so I'm on Twitter at Amir Razan. And uh, I'm hanging out on the Discord. Uh, if you go to discord.dragonry.org, um, I'm there most of the time unless I'm psych faulting. Um, but those would be probably the two <laughs> two primary places. And then as far as the website, dragonruby.org um, is where you can find information on our um, our uh, small business offering for like building native uh, line of business applications. And then our uh, game engine offering, which allows you to build uh, video games cross-platform. And like I said, uh, if you can't afford a license, just email me. I'll, I'll hook you up. No questions asked. Yay. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is the end of Ruby Galaxy version 0.3. So next month, we're going to come back on the last Thursday of every single month. And we're going to be doing some papers and stuff like that. If you want to be part of Ruby Galaxy, you want to speak here, you can go to papercall.io slash rubygalaxy or rubygalaxy.o to be a part of the next version. We'll be announcing people who are attending um, either a week or two weeks beforehand. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amir. This has been amazing. Glad you enjoyed it. Hope it was a good conversation. <laughs>